get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Ethan Anderson. He's co-founder of My Time, where you can book appointments for anything online, haircuts, oil changes, even dental exams, you name it. They have over 2 million businesses to choose from. Previously, he founded Red Beacon, where they raised $7.4 million, grew the team to over 20 people before they were acquired by Home Depot. Uh, We have a a huge slacker on our hands. Ethan went from Duke Economics to Harvard MBA. He worked at McKinsey, Buy.com, Starbucks, Clorox, Google, and then founded two companies, one with a successful exit. Ethan, thanks for joining me. Wow, that was a great intro. Thanks. You should use this for your about page on my time. Uh, you, you hit everything. You, you missed the time that I made the basketball team, though, in high school. <laughs> <laughs> First was a really crazy story where you fell off a glacier. That I didn't. I wanted to oh, talk okay, about the yeah. beginning. Then we talk. Non sequitur. Okay. So, so yeah. So you know, I was. Um, I used to be an adventurer, and I was uh, backpacking through New Zealand, and they have glaciers in the South Island of New Zealand. And I picked up a brochure that said, you know, glacier climbing expedition, no experience required, completely safe. I was like, oh, great. I have no here, experience. Here, sign here. So yeah, you don't, no, you that's die. the thing. It's like, I don't even think they have these kind of laws where, you know, they're responsible for anything. Um, and so here we are climbing over the glacier. There's not even an established route. We do have an ice axe and crampons and, you know, helmet. And there's a guide. Um, but he basically has. Do you has, feel safe at the time when you're doing this or no? No, definitely not. You didn't. Um, okay. I know, I know I didn't feel safe because I actually got a photo of the crevice I fell through thinking, God, this is crazy. We're going to climb this crevice. And so I took a picture of it before I fell into it. <laughs> so I clearly did not feel safe. Um, I better get a picture before. before I... Yeah, like it was almost like a prequel. Imagine um, that you know a crevice looks like this, right? Right. Yeah. And they had us sp- spread our legs across the crevice. Oh, my like God. This. Are you serious? And then so we're and the only thing that's really holding you is you have an ice axe that you dug into the side wall and you've got your feet, which are crampons with spikes, dug into the sides. And then you take a step and you're kind of moving through the crevice, but below you is just you know, a lot of a lot of height. You look down and it's just there's empty bottom. space. Empty space. You're inside of the crevice. And remember, I'd never done this before. I'm not like an expert. Right. Uh, so sure enough, right foot slipped out of the foothold. You know, that I'd carved for myself. I don't know why that happened, but it just fell out. I mean, maybe it wasn't dug in enough. But I had the ice axe dug in. So as I fell, I tried to hold on to it, but all that did was rip the shoulder out of the socket. Are you serious? And yeah. So the shoulder is wedged under the armpit. I go plummeting to the bottom of the crevice. Oh. You know, and I land, and, you know, it was melted ice water because it was summertime. And so there was just a pool of melted ice water at the bottom. So I fall into the pool. And by the way, you I fell really- into the crevice. I fell to the bottom of the crevice, and with a separated shoulder. We had a, the shoulder is completely dislocated. Um, at first, I couldn't move. Like I'm, I don't know, probably for five or six seconds, maybe longer. I was just paralyzed, and so I was really scared that I'd broken my back or something. But then movement came back, and so it was just like the shock of the landing or oh something. Oh my god! Yeah. And uh, you know, so I stand up, sopping wet and cold, and in a lot of pain. You know, many places, but especially the shoulder. And there I am looking up like, oh, I can't get out of here. <laughs> you know? And so they, uh, there was a guide. Um, he had a radio. He <laughs> oh my God. That's crazy. Um, amazingly, the helicopter got there very quickly. I would say probably 10 minutes. Really? But, wow. You know, I'm just, I'm very calm. You know, you know how you're going to react in a situation like this. There was only one thought that kept going through my head like a broken record over and over and over again. You know what it is? No. The thought was, I can't believe this is happening to me. Because <laughs> it, it feels like the kind of thing that happens to other people, and you're watching it on TV, and here it is, here I am, and it's like, <laughs> this is actually happening to me. Um, that was, it's so weird, I couldn't stop thinking that. But they dropped a rope down, and I was able to tie it and, with my good arm and kind of hold on to it, and they lifted me out of it, and then you know, reached down to pull me up over it, um, and then loaded me onto the helicopter, 
And actually, if I, I'll just keep telling the story because it gets yeah, funnier. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So they flew. They, they gave me a shot for the pain, so I was kind of knocked out, um, and then got me out of my wet clothes. And they flew me about forty minutes or so to the closest hospital, which is you know obviously pretty far away because I was on a glacier. And so we land on the helipad, and they take me in, and you know did some X rays, and they decided they were going to have to give me general anesthesia to pull the shoulder back in because it Ugh. had been out so long. Yeah. It had been out so long really that painful. it was really frozen. It was like it was just all the muscles had just gone rigid, and so they just were not going to be able to pull it in while I was awake. Oh man! Actually, I think I'm okay with. I don't think I would have wanted to be up for that. But so I'm so I'm semi unconscious. You know, they only needed me to me, needed me to be out for like a couple of minutes, so they just gave me a little bit of anesthesia, I guess. But I guess I wasn't totally unconscious because I suddenly like came alive and tried to bite the doctor's arm off. <laughs> Like some primal instinct <laughs> where they were trying to hold me down so I couldn't like bite the doctor. So you were partially conscious at that time. Yeah, I don't remember any of this. They, they told me this later. Hopefully uh, you don't do that if you get too you drink too much. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Be careful, don't back in without telling me. And uh, then they called my parents and left a voicemail back in the US and they said, strong New Zealand accent, you know, some rural town. This is a niece of New Zealand. Your son was in a terrible glacier accident. He was admitted to the hospital to die. And oh he, they said today, but it sounded like to oh, die. Oh no. And so basically she communicated that I was already dead <laughs> to my parents. So, you know, just, it, it was- uh, That's it was crazy. Adventure. So right. I think that's a, a great story, and I want you to tell it. I didn't – I've seen it the first time. I'm glad you didn't tell it to me beforehand. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> what – you know, I find it interesting because a lot of entrepreneurs do the adventures. It's like a thrill-seeking thing. Um, have you done other, like, thrill-seeking adventures? And do you find it helps you business-wise? I mean, you know – I'm 40 years old now, so you know I think my adventuring has kind of you know slowed down a little bit. But sure, when I was younger, I mean you know everything: skiing, snowmobiling, um, you know 30-day like backpacking trips through the wilderness. You know I, I loved all that, all that kind of do, stuff. Do sure. driving, driving you... fast. <laughs> I don't know if that counts as an adventure, but you know racing. I mean all that stuff was a lot of fun. That's crazy. Yeah, thanks yeah, for sharing. Like, that. My time and the startup life consumes, I think, my desire right. for the, the thrill-seeking. While it may not be physical, it's certainly like mentally and emotionally just as exciting. And every day is different and challenging. Thrill-seeking is being sued unexpectedly by someone in Australia for a trademark that you didn't violate. So, Yeah, yes. well, yeah, of course not that part. No. Um, you know, it's interesting because I think somebody who becomes an entrepreneur has a real comfort with ambiguity with unexpectedness, yep. you know, with change, and you know you're not going to start a business and everything is going to go like you planned. In fact, that probably yeah. happened on the second day. Yeah. And so people who are looking for comfort and security and they're conservative don't tend to go into entrepreneurship. Yeah. And so, and they probably also don't tend to like do extreme sports. You know what I mean? So, so Ethan, and, what yeah. did you want to do? What did you want to do when you grew up, when you were young? Oh, when I was young? Uh, yeah. You know, I think I, I dreamed of politics. You did? Yeah. You know, kind of because I saw uh, you had like political science, I think, at Duke or something. Yeah, I was a public policy and economics double major at Duke. Um, I was really passionate about politics. Worked in government. Worked with the majority leader of Congress. Worked uh, in a lobbying firm. You know, to see different sides of the government. Worked for the mayor of Los Angeles. So I, I definitely had an interest in it. Um, I think that you know, like many people, I think I just got disillusioned with it and felt like I wouldn't really be able to make a difference or an impact. You know, kind of the way the system is set up. I and mean, if you look at the people who are running, you realize that we just don't get the best of America running for office anymore. You really just don't. And um, I just think because <laughs> obviously we could see that with some of the can, stuff you know, going on now, without, without kind of uh, naming names, you know. But you can obviously see that the candidates could probably be better, and um, it's frustrating. Um, but you know the good people don't want to subject themselves to it because they right. know they will, will encounter too much resistance with the way the system is set up. Yeah. So was your dad an entrepreneur when you were growing up? Yeah. So he's um, a vitamin company. He's a vitamin. Oh, uh, really? Standard process. Are you serious? Uh, Wait. Yeah. Wh oh, okay. Wait. Yeah, what, what does he do? So he's the basically he's the distributor for a certain part of the country, and what that means is he develops that territory. He's got exclusive selling rights in that part of the United States. So you do that from um, when you were young too. From, from that's like cutting edge. That, at that time, that was probably cutting edge stuff. 
I mean, imagine I'm 40 years old and he was doing it before I was born. So he's been doing it for more than 40 years. Wow, that's Started out as a, you know, feet on the street salesperson and all the way until he got his own distributorship and he's been doing, you know, phenomenally well with it. That's unbelievable. Yeah, for people who don't know standard process, it's like one of the best vitamin nutritional companies you can can ask for. I've taken their stuff, SP Complete, and a bunch of their other supplements before. Yeah, I used to work in his warehouse, you know, picking and packing orders. Um, so I definitely really? grew up. With it. Yeah. Um, and my mom is a psychologist, so I never saw either parent going to work for somebody else. If mm. that makes sense, they were never employees; yeah. they were all both in business for themselves. Yeah. Um, so maybe that had an impact. I, you know, I don't know. So what did you learn from your dad growing up? Um, what did I learn from my dad? Yeah. Um, so hard work. Um, Great product, great customer service, um, really true passion for what you're selling. I think that no one believes more in standard process than my father. Yeah. Uh, I know you think it's a great product, and it is, but I mean, yeah. you will not find someone who's a bigger supporter and fan of it than him. Does he make you take all the, the supplements? He certainly has. Yeah, <laughs> he certainly has. I mean, it's funny. Like when we, we used to go on these like you know vacations together, and it's like a whole suitcase was just standard process supplements that he was bringing for our personal I use. I love your dad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what's yeah. the best advice he's given you? Would you say the best advice? You know, I think it's really you, fine. It sounds like you own. talk to him a lot. And no, you I guys do. I mean, I think it's really stuff. find your own way. You know, he wasn't like, <clears throat> well, I'm very ambitious and I work very hard. He wasn't like one of these like Chinese tiger moms, you know, stereotypes where he's like, I want you to go and study. I want you to go play piano. It was really like, you go find your own way. I'll, I'll be there to support you, you know, but do the things that you want to do and do them really well. Yeah. Um, and for me, like that was computers. I loved computers growing up. He got me an Apple IIc, paid $200 a month for my crazy America online usage, you know, and he just kind of supported that and, and you know, endured it. Um, and encouraged it. And so I think that uh, really find, letting your, your kind of kids find the things they're passionate about and supporting them through those endeavors, probably like the Montessori method, if you will, right, right. It, you know, might be better than you know, kind of forcing them to do things they're not interested in. Yeah. Now I'm surprised you didn't do something in the health field based off of what you saw your dad do. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, it wasn't what, what, uh, gravi- what I gravitated to. Yeah. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why I think... Um, I always like to do things at scale. And you know how we talked about I had this interest in politics? One mm-hmm. of the things that appealed to me about politics was you do things at scale. You make a public policy that affects millions of people. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Things that affect one person at a time were never as interesting to me. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about quick returns for a second. Oh, okay. Sure. That's a yeah. flat pass. Well, you know, so I graduated. Because, again, like I would think, I'll let you tell the story, but. But, you know, with my time, you have you know success with the Red Beacon, my time, and I would think whatever happened then, I don't know the full story, that would have kind of, you know, been a little scary time, so. Well, it was a different era. Yeah. So, you know, I graduated college in 1998. It was the first dot-com boom. And there were a lot of new business models being explored using the internet for the first time. Um, one of the things that was really popular was, uh, they called them e-tailers. And they're basically online retailers um, who are pure play. They're only online. And a lot of the classic brick and mortar stores, they hadn't really come online yet, like Barnes & Noble or PetSmart or whatever. They were still just physical stores. There was Amazon for sure. um, But a lot, you know, Pets.com, eToys, eStyle, there were just so many and there was like every vertical had their own. That was the very beginning, right? Very beginning. Yeah. Now, one of the big pain points that they were experiencing is how horrible it was to return products. you basically ship something back through UPS and, you know, four weeks later you'd get a refund because it was sitting in a warehouse somewhere and they weren't good at handling what they call reverse logistics. Yeah. And then they'd refund you, but they wouldn't know what to do with the product. You know, they couldn't put it back on and, you know, to resell it. Right. They didn't have really good liquidation, you know, system set up. So I thought, what if we built an integrated business, partner with all of the pack and ship centers like Staples, mailboxes, et cetera, which is now the UPS store. Um, and we had let c- customers drop their return off at those locations. The shipment, the return shipment was just handled for them. And then we dealt with the return for the e-tailer. You know, we'd basically inspect it, make sure it complied with the return policy. We'd put it back in inventory if it wasn't open. We'd send it to a liquidator if it was, or the manufacturer if it was broken. We would just handle everything for them. It was almost like returns as a service, making the consumer experience better and having better returns for the e-tailer. Why'd you even think of this? This seems like so random. 
Um, you know, I was a McKinsey consultant for two years. I was doing a lot of internet strategy, working with a lot of online retail firms. Yeah. Um, certainly was an early adopter in e-commerce and I experienced the problem myself of how frustrating it was to have to return something. Mm -hmm. And so I think I see a problem and I want to solve it. That's right. kind of what I So then what happened? <laughs> Well, you know, it was interesting. So this is a, again a different age. You know, this is 1998. Oh, I'm this sorry, is, this is 2000. This is right this is around the bubble. Yeah, this is right before the bubble started. Um, you write you, back then. You wrote big business plans, like so. I bought this software called Quick. Uh, what was it called? Um, business Plan Pro by Palo Alto Software. And I found a partner uh, who had, you know, graduated from UCLA's business school, and the two of us worked together night and day to write this great plan. Financial models, charts, pro everything was in there. It was like the waterfall method of business planning. <laughs> and, um, We're coming know, full just, circle. Was, We're going backwards with the waterfall exactly. method. Yeah. You know, totally. People don't do that anymore, by the way. Today, when you pitch a VC, you have like a 10 or 12 page PowerPoint. People don't write these business plans anymore. Um, but the plan was so good that it got picked up as the sample plan for the business plan pro software. That was the sample plan. Really? That they, they would box with the software of like, you should build this. Wow. Like, that's it's a great plan. Um, th but great plans don't translate into great businesses necessarily. Uh, we're raising money for it, partnering with Staples, getting all those connections, and then all of a sudden the dot-com crash happened. You know, it was yeah. March of 2000, um, all the funding dried up, a lot of our own company, the companies that were going to be our customers, they were suddenly like, can't invest in anything else, laying people off, shutting their doors down eventually. Um, it was really a dark time. Um, yeah. You know, I heard San Francisco's population drop like 15% or something. So it wow. was a dark time. And, um, you know, I was kind of waiting for this to pass. It wasn't really passing. So I was like, you know, there's an opportunity to go work at a local e commerce firm. It was called Buy.com, B U Y. Yeah. The second biggest online retailer after Amazon it was doing about $800 million a year in sales. So it was pretty sizable. Yeah, when you say local, it seems like small, but that's a huge company. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it was local because like, you have all the big local. companies around I was living in Los Angeles. So <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. You're right, you're right. No, it was actually pretty big. Um, yeah, probably the biggest seller huge. of outlets and other things at that time. And so they, I had an opportunity to be the director of strategy at Buy.com. And I said, you know, I don't know if this is going to be a long-term thing for me, but like while I wait for the storm to pass. So maybe you I'll go knew, did you know at this time, like, I'm going to go out and start my own company eventually? And I, I just, you did. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to. But, you know, I kind of, the, the dot-com, you know, bust, as they called it, actually was like pretty long lasting. It wasn't just a quick blip. It was actually like a major downturn for a long time. Yeah. Affected the technology industry for years. Um, so I didn't, you know, pursue quick returns again. Today, I don't know if the business is necessary because now you just print out a return label on your printer and you like drop it off at the local like mailbox, you know, uh, UPS store or whatever, and it just instant return. So the system, I feel like now the, the companies are much better at it than they were back then. Yeah. So what'd you learn at buy.com? Um, you know, Buy.com was very sophisticated with pricing. That was really where they differentiated. They built a very complex pricing system that I managed. Um, there was over a million SKUs. So actually, let me let me actually tell you what Buy.com really was. Yeah. It was a front end for different distributors that they would partner with. So they would go and they'd say, hey, there's this company called Ingram Micro. They have a gigantic set of warehouses with a huge set of SKUs, and they have wholesale pricing. Buy.com would carry their inventory put up a nice, really merchandise, beautiful website and set the pricing for the retail price and manage the customer relationship and then get an order and just transmit that to Ingram Micro, whoever the distributor sort was. Sort of like drop shipping-ish? Like drop shipping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Buy.com didn't carry inventory. Different than Amazon, which actually does carry inventory. Yeah. Amazon buys stuff in bulk from manufacturers and then ships it out of their own warehouse. Buy.com did not. So it was more of a virtual low asset model. Yeah. Um, so I managed a system about pricing, and one of the things I learned is you want to have the perception of low price, and so you take all of the hot new items, call it the top 100 sellers, and you price them like below market, maybe even below cost a little bit. So everyone's like, whoa, Buy.com is so cheap. You know, the new um, you know, Palm Pilot 3 just came out. They're cheaper than anybody out, out there. I'm always going to shop at Buy.com. What they don't realize is the other million items are actually very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm, I'm sure I get sucked expensive. into that. Like yeah, probably, the accessories, yeah. you know. And so it's about upselling, it's about cross-selling. It's, about, it's yeah. about the perception. And so the system that we built managed the revenue and the margins, you know, the profit margins. Wow. And it did that by 
having high velocity SKUs that generated lots of revenue and low velocity SKUs that had lots of margin. Yep. And at the end of the day, coming up with a combination that got you both. It's it very advanced. Yeah. Very complex. So mm-hmm. at what point, you know, I can go on and on about all these. I mean, because you, you went from there to Starbucks, to Clorox, to Google. Uh, just to quickly with Google, you know, what's uh, one of your favorite memories or, uh, you know, stories from Google? Google is really the, the greatest company I've worked for. I really love the experience. I learned so much about product development, product management. Um, I don't think I could have basically been an entrepreneur without that Google experience. Yeah. But, um, you know, my greatest memory of Google is they gave me, I, I came into Google and they were like, well, you've got like three different jobs you can do. You could do marketing, you could do product management, or you could do international product management, which is launching our products in other countries. So I was like, oh, cool. You know, I've never gotten to do international business before. You know, this international job sounds really fun. So I walk into it. So there's like one head of international. His name is Adam, Adam Freed. He had um, a big, big team, probably 50 people. I don't even think I really got to meet him for like three months. It's my boss. Um, And then they're like, well, your first product is Google Video. It's a new product. We just launched it at the Consumer Electronics Show on stage with Larry Page, the founder of Google, wow. and Robin Williams, you know, on no stage. No pressure, right? Yeah, and they're like, okay, now we want you to go launch this in other countries. I was like, oh, great. Um, where should I launch it? Well, you got to figure that out. Oh, okay. Well, how what do, do you, you call it, China? <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, I mean, they're like, how do you internationalize a product? Well, right. you know, just go work. It, I, there was like no direction. There was no management. It was like, just go figure it out, decide what to you do, have to and be an come back and it's done. Yeah. And I mean, I loved it. You know, I, I really don't think a lot of people would love that situation. They'd be like, this is crazy. But for me, it's like, I got really scrappy. I started running around the Google organization, getting people's help. There was a great team of internationalization engineers who would come from Netscape that I got to work with. Um, you know, sat down with the existing Google video team and learned about all the things that would need to be done. And it's complex. I mean, there's content, there's privacy policies, there's like translation of the interface. There's a whole bunch of things that have to be done. Um, and then, and I ran over to those other countries, not ran, but flew over and like ran focus groups to learn about what those customers were really looking for and what existed today. You know, so I had a lot to learn and I just did it. Um, and launched it in about 16 different countries and got to number one market share really everywhere except for Japan, which uh, YouTube was number one in. And so um, really great experience, loved it, worked day and night on it. And then Google bought YouTube, and so it was all for nothing because it got consumed into YouTube. But um, still a wonderful experience. You know, That's amazing. Just was so passionate about it. And I think because it let me be an entrepreneur within a bigger company. Yeah, yeah. So I wh- yeah, go, yeah. go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I don't think it's like that today. I think if you want that experience, you've got to go to an up-and-coming company. So some commonalities between Starbucks and Google when I worked there is both of them were in like the heyday of their growth. And I'm not saying that you know there's not innovation taking place today. Google's obviously doing wonderful things with self-driving cars and drones and all kinds of things. But it's not the same company that like you can come in and they just say, you don't hey, get free reign. Just it out. Yeah. 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 You don't get free reign anymore. Now there's real management. There's real process. Things go pretty slow. Um, you know, they have a lot to protect and, you know, they have to control their downside risk. And so it's not the same place, but if you're, if you want that experience and I recommend it for anyone, because before you get not to become an entrepreneur, I think it's good to sort of learn, you know, on somebody else's dime, if you will, how to do, how to do certain things. Right. Go to the really fast growing company. Don't go to the really big mature one. Like don't go to GE, you know, don't go to Apple, go to the ones that are like rocket ships. Go to like just, my time. Uh, yeah. Like my no. time for instance. <laughs> Or, uh, hiring. What are you hiring uh, for these days? Uh, software engineers, uh, uh, user interface designers, um, enterprise sales reps to go after kind of big, larger chains and franchises. Mm-hmm. Actually, there's a lot of roles open right now because it's right. a fast company. All right, I know someone that may have some software engineers for you. Um, sure. Yeah, so I'll I'll make a note of that. Um, so why did you leave then? Obviously, you love Google. What made you decide to leave? I had this experience where, um, I, you know, I went to my five-year Harvard Business School reunion in June of 2008, and uh, it was probably like, you know May 31st actually. And so uh, it was great to see everybody. I really loved my classmates there. Had fantastic, you know, friendships uh, that I developed, and everybody was doing incredible things. I mean, there was Sal Khan who started Khan Academy, probably the greatest nonprofit learning site on the internet. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there was you know, a guy named Chris Dixon who had started two startups and is now a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, a top VC firm in Silicon Valley. I mean, there was one after another, you know, and they were just, I mean, everybody I spoke with, 
friend of mine was like, I've started the largest private equity fund in the Middle East. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, kind of, you know, I'm doing great things. You felt like Google, a slacker going like, in or something? Away 5,007. You know, I just, I was like, I didn't want to come back to the, the next reunion and be like, I'm still just an employee somewhere. I want to be like, I've gone and accomplished this. I've done this great thing. And it kind of reawakened my kind of entrepreneurial leanings, which I'd had early on in life. Mm -hmm. And I just, I couldn't, it's like every day became painful from that day on until mm -hmm. I left. Mm -hmm. We have too much to cover in like four minutes. But, um, <laughs> so Red Beacon, tell mm -hmm. me about the sale and how you celebrated. Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I threw a party and invited all my friends and got lots of like food and drink. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't, you know, I think it's, it's more from, it's not like how I celebrated. It's more about the mentality shifting of becoming wealthy overnight. Yeah. You know, usually it's like, it's not quite like winning the lottery because you had to work your butt off for it. Whereas like winning the lottery is you got lucky. But it is in the same sense, like day, you know, at this point, you're not, you don't have any money. At this point you do. And like, you know, kind of mentally, like, what does this mean? Yeah. You know, like, I wasn't like you're born with a silver spoon in my mouth and lots of like big trust fund. It wasn't like that. Right. And so I think that that was sort of something that took like yeah. a year to get used to of like repositioning your thought about that and what that means. Um, yeah. But I think the more, you know, the really exciting moment, obviously the sale is great, but the most exciting moment in Red Beacon history is we won this thing called TechCrunch 50. And it is, it, nothing really exists like it anymore because they it broke up actually after our year because the two founders of TechCrunch 50 got into a fight. But it was TechCrunch, which is the biggest technology blog, you know, in the world. Sure. And this guy, Jason Calacanis, who's a wonderful technologist and promoter and entrepreneur. And they'd come together to build this conference of launching the best startup in the world each year. And they did once a year. They it do a, something similar now, don't they? With this week in startups or... Well, so that's or, Jason's thing. Oh, Jason, okay. they, Jason does this week in startups. Yeah. And he created something called the Launch Conference. The Launch Conference, yes. And then TechCrunch created something similar called TechCrunch Disrupt. But the truth is, is like you split the baby, and neither one of them anywhere has anywhere near the gravitas as TechCrunch Fifty had when they were doing it together as one. Right. And so basically, a thousand startups applied to be in TechCrunch Fifty. And you know, I looked at my co-founders, and we discussed it, and we thought, you know, boy, if we got into this, we're one of the top fifty startups because they choose fifty. Hence TechCrunch 50. Right. Um, you know, that is going to be game changing. We can go to VCs. We can say we were a TechCrunch 50 finalist. I mean, that is an amazing accomplishment. And we didn't know if we'd get in. In fact, we were so excited when we got selected to be one of the top 50. Um, it was unbelievable. And so we it's a two-day event. You're presenting on stage. Didn't past winners of this were like Mint or like weren't there like some, mm -hmm. some amazing past, right? Oh, I mean, let me tell you, like, the past winners were Mint and Yammer. Yammer sold for, I think, $1.3 or $1.4 billion to Microsoft. Right, right. People who were companies that were in TechCrunch 50 but didn't win include Dropbox, ZocDoc. I mean, these are multi dollar right. companies. valuation companies today. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it is really the best of the best. And there's 100,000 people who are watching it on the live stream and about two or 3,000 in the audience. Wow. And so we won. And we didn't just get That's selected. Amazing. We actually won. And I will tell you, I didn't think we were going to win, not even until the very last second when we did win. It was, they bring the last five finalists onto the stage, and they're like, number five, so-and-so, number four, so-and-so. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, it's down to two. I'm like, I, I'm not making this up. I was thinking, God, it's so amazing that we were the second best startup. <laughs> it didn't even occur we were going to win until we won. I didn't even let myself even go there. Oh, um, so when we won, it was really, it must be like winning an Academy Award, you know, for our industry. Um, it was game changing. I knew at that exact moment how important that was going to be. Yeah. In fact, Home Depot, who ultimately acquired Red Beacon, they only found out about us because of TechCrunch 50. Mm. They heard about it too. And they're like, wow, a company in the home services space, you know, won this technology competition. You know, we got to watch this. This is big. And so the president of Home Depot had reached out and, uh, you know, we'd had breakfast with him at least a year, year and a half before the acquisition. So they were really tracking it. Yeah. Like, so, yeah, that was a game-changing moment. That's amazing. Um, so then you get – it's not a windfall of, of success and wealth from, from selling. So how long did you relax before starting my time? Oh, it was like a matter of just days. Days. I went to the, I went to the Galapagos Islands. Just days. 
there. Yeah, to celebrate, I went. You know, we we took a, just a mom and son trip to the Galapagos and the Ecuadorian rainforest. Yeah. Um, and I came back, and it was just me at that point. I didn't have a team or anything for for my time. And I just sat there in my living room working on a business. You know, uh, product specs. Got a kind of contract developer to kind of build a prototype so I could raise some early money and hire some engineers. You know, full time. Yeah. And you know, I'd started on that almost immediately, and it was because I felt that the idea couldn't wait. It wasn't like I was like, oh, you know what I'm going to do right now? I want to go work some more. It wasn't that. It was that I had a burning idea. You did. I didn't I'd ever have a better one. And I thought, you know, the longer I wait to do this, the, the more time I give someone else to get there before me. So the burning idea was, was this just burning inside you since, like, well, at Red Beacon? It was. It was. Yeah. I mean, I'd certainly, I'd certainly been thinking a lot about it at Red Beacon. You know, the idea of local, of a site, a website, or a mobile app where people could come to find and book appointments and purchase the services yeah. felt to me as big as Amazon.com. Amazon's doing physical goods and digital goods. Well, I want to do local services, but the same concept. And that just felt like a very big idea. It was the era of Groupon, you know, when we started right. this. Right. I'm in Chicago. Yeah. Groupon <laughs> was, yeah. Fastest huge. growing company in history. Uh, got to a billion dollars in revenue in no time, and um, I mean, you see how big local commerce can be. I'm looking up. I have like uh, 30 questions for you, but um, we are. It looks like um, out of time here. So. Uh, it was a real I, I appreciate it. You know, and this is awesome. Um, thank you for sharing all this expertise and and knowledge. Where should we point people towards um, the check out? Obviously, mytime.com. Anywhere else that people should check out to find out more. Well, if you're a business owner, we have um, kind of our business landing page, mytime.com slash merchants, okay. M-E-R-C-H-A-N-T-S, okay. and that walks you through the product, it shows lots of screenshots, kind of shows you what we can do, and I really want to encourage all the small business owners, you know, if you don't use MyTime, use something, um, don't just put your head in the sand because the world has changed, and I don't want you to be left behind in the way that all these small stores got wiped out by Walmarts and um, Targets and Home Depots of the world, you have to adopt with the times, and this will give you the ability to do so. Yeah, yeah. Ethan, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 